Hey guys, this is Caleb with the Command Valley bringing you our first Commander Deck Tech of the new year. Happy New Year everyone, and thanks for all of your amazing support last year. We'd also like to thank Game Grid Lehigh for sponsoring this video. You can check out their new and improved online store and support our channel while doing so by clicking the link in the description below. We also have a deck list in the description that you can use to copy and paste right into their deck builder and buy any of the cards that you see in this video. To support the channel directly, head on over to our Patreon at patreon.com slash commandvalley to sign up today. The commander I've chosen to talk about today is Joda, Archmage Eternal. He costs 1, a blue, a red, and a white mana to cast for a 4-3 human wizard with flying. Don't let that mana cost fool you though, because he's not a Jeskai commander, but a 5 color commander, because his second ability says you may pay Wooburg, or white, blue, black, red, and a green, rather than pay the mana cost for spells that you cast. So we are going to take advantage of this second ability by running and cheating in all of the biggest, nastiest creatures and spells that we can find. The best part about this is the fact that we can play any and every card in any color that we want to. Also, it's really easy to switch out your current big spells to test new ones because once you start playing cards past a certain high CMC, they're pretty much all game-changing spells, so it really just comes down to whatever you feel like playing. It's going to be super powerful no matter what. As I said, the cards in my deck that I want to be casting with Joda's help are very powerful and would normally cost between 6 and 11 mana or more. With that out of the way, let's begin talking about the essentials in this deck. Starting with the ramp section, I am running Arcane Signet, which will tap for any color in this deck. I've got two creatures in this section, which are Bloom Tender and Fabro Elder, and they both have the ability to tap and for each color among permanents you control, add one mana of that color. Remember with these cards that the color of a card is not the same as color identity. So Joda's color is only blue, red, and white, for example, but his color identity is all five colors. So if you have Bloom Tender and Joda on the field, and you tap Bloom Tender for mana, you will get one green from Bloom Tender, and then a blue, a red, and a white from Joda. So you would still need a black permanent to get a black mana. After that, I'm running Farseek, Nature's Lore, Cultivate, and Kodama's Reach, which all grab lands from our deck and put them into play. Smothering Tithe also makes it into my deck because our playgroup tends to have a lot of card draw in their decks. And being able to sacrifice treasures for any color can be really useful, especially if you are missing a color in the early game. I am currently running Soul Ring because it is incredibly useful in the early game, obviously, and is still really good if Joda gets removed, and yes, yeah, Soul Ring is super powerful in most every single deck, but Joda is one of the extremely few decks that may prefer running something in its place. So currently I've got Soul Ring, don't necessarily need Sol Ring in this deck. Lastly, I'm running Chromatic Lantern, which taps for one mana of any color and makes it so all of my lands can do the same thing. Speaking of mana fixing, it is super important in this deck, so I'm also running Prismatic Omen, which turns all of its controller's lands into every basic land type in addition to their other types. So, for example, even your Evolving Wilds could tap for one of any color if you had Prismatic Omen on the field. Dryad of the Elysian Grove is a creature with Prismatic Omen's ability and says that you can also play an additional land each turn. And Scape Shift is a sorcery that lets you sacrifice any number of lands to search your deck for that many land cards and put them onto the battlefield tapped. Just make sure that none of your opponents can flash in an opposition agent before you sacrifice all of your lands to Scape Shift. That would be bad. Next up, we've got our draw section, and I'm running two Planeswalkers, Kiora Behemoth Beckoner and Teferi Master of Time in this section. Kiora draws you a card whenever a creature with power 4 or greater enters the battlefield under your control, and you can also remove a loyalty counter from her to untap big mana producers like Bloom Tender and others that we'll talk about in just a bit. Teferi's abilities can be activated on any player's turn and at instant speed, which allows him to get up to 4 activations per cycle. This card is absolutely crazy, and his plus 1 ability draws you a card, then makes you discard a card and his minus three ability can be a super useful tool as well. These two walkers are mostly in here as pet cards and they get taken out every now and then for other draw spells 
as I'm testing new cards, etc. But they keep making it back into my deck and I really like them. Ristic Study and Guardian Project are both fantastic enchantments for drawing cards and are much more likely to stick around than our Planeswalkers. Painful Truths is one of my favorite cards for this deck because of its converge ability. It's a sorcery that costs two generic and one black to cast, but says you draw X cards and you lose X life, where X is the number of colors of mana spent to cast Painful Truths. You are almost always going to be able to draw at least three cards minimum with this card, however using Joda's ability you can pay Wooburg to cast it instead and draw five cards. Five mana and five life for five cards is a pretty amazing rate. Another spell you'll want to cast using Joda's ability is Genesis Ultimatum, which basically allows you to draw five cards, put any of the permanents from those five cards that you draw onto the battlefield for free, and then the rest go into your hand. So not only are you getting to draw five cards for five mana, using Joda's ability, you're also getting to play the permanents for free and it doesn't cost you a single life. That rate is stupid good. I'm also running some creatures that draw us cards and they are Consecrated Sphinx and Jenga Taxius because who needs friends when you have Phyrexia? And Kozilek Butcher of Truth because I'm just that evil, I guess. This is your first look into the scary, busted, nasty side of this Joda deck, and here there be monsters. Before we move on, I just want to quickly mention two amazing cards that are sort of, but not really, part of this category, and those are Sensei's Divining Top and Scroll Rack. These powerful artifacts aren't here to draw me a ton of cards, but to help regulate and control what I draw or keep in my hand. They're especially useful if you have ways to shuffle your library with cards like Fetchlands and Tutors after deciding you don't want what's on top anymore. Moving on to removal, my current build could maybe use a little bit more, but at the moment I'm running Path to Exile and Swords to Plowshares because they are just so darn efficient at what they do. And I also have Anguished Unmaking that costs two mana more and an extra three life, but is totally worth it because it exiles any non-land permanent. I might as well just tell you now that this deck runs four of the five Praetors, and the next one in the list is Shaeldred Whispering One, which is one of the nastiest cards in this deck. At the beginning of each of your upkeeps, you get to return a creature from your graveyard to the battlefield, and at the beginning of your opponent's upkeeps, they must sacrifice a creature. Not exactly the most efficient removal, but she'll still earn you some collective groans around the table when you play her. And that always makes it worth it. Ulamog the Infinite Gyre, on the other hand, destroys a target permanent when you cast him. Not to mention the Annihilator 4 that he shares with his brother Kozilek, plus he's indestructible. I can't even begin to describe how great it feels to get this guy out on turn 4 or 5, or just casting him for only 5 mana in general. As for board wipes, I am currently running Cyclonic Rift, which needs no introduction or explanation, Supreme Verdict, which can't be countered and destroys all creatures, and In Garrick's Wake, which destroys all creatures and planeswalkers that you don't control. We've also got my favorite Praetor here, Elish Norn Grand Cenobite. She's a 4-7 with Vigilance and gives your creatures plus 2 plus 2, and your opponent's creatures minus 2 minus 2. More often than not, she will not wipe all of your opponent's creatures, however, she does a great job of getting rid of those small, annoying utility creatures and seriously weakens anything left standing. Most decks that cheat huge things into play tend to become a target for the rest of the table early on, so we need some ways to protect Joda and the huge spells that he's discounting for us. That's why both Lightning Greaves and Swiftfoot Boots are must-have equipments for this deck. The sooner we can get Joda Hexproof or Shroud, the better. These also work great for giving our huge monsters like Ulamog and Kozilek haste so that they can annihilate our opponents the turn that they enter the battlefield. Heroic Intervention and Teferi's Protection will protect our whole board at instant speed when we need it the most. As for creatures, Vigor prevents damage dealt to your other creatures and turns that damage into plus one plus one counters instead. He's also a very formidable 6-6 with Trample. 
Avicen Angel of Hope might not seem like a monster when compared to the likes of the Eldrazi and the Praetors, but she is just as feared and not easy to deal with at all. She is an 8-8 with flying, vigilance, and indestructible, and she makes all of your other permanents indestructible as well. Progenitus doesn't help protect any of your other stuff, but there are very few ways of removing him. Cards that don't target him, like edict effects and board wipes that don't deal damage, are pretty much the only way to deal with him. I wouldn't necessarily call him a win condition, but when this guy gets out, you can end people. Now that we're through talking about the essentials, let's talk about some other enablers in this deck. Starting with other cards that help us cheat things in. Joda is the creature form of an older card called Fist of Sons, and it never hurts to run redundant ways of doing what your commander wants to do, especially because of how important getting that Wooberg discount is to this deck. Another fun way to cheat spells into play with this deck is with Maelstrom Archangel. She costs Wooberg to cast, and she's a 5-5 angel with flying. Whenever you deal combat damage with her, you may cast a spell from your hand for free. If you have the old Complex version of this card, it says that you can play a non-land card instead of cast a spell, so just be aware that abilities such as Ulamogs will still trigger when you play them with her. You can also run cards like Elvish Piper and Quicksilver Amulet, even though I'm not in my deck at the moment, in order to cheat big creatures into play. In this next section, many of the cards that I want to talk about can be considered ramp or are really close to being ramp, but I've got 10 cards that are the best ways to cast more and more spells each turn in this deck. When Sword of Feast and Famine is equipped, it gives the equipped creature plus two plus two and protection from black and from green. Also, whenever the equipped creature deals damage to a player, that player discards a card and you untap all of your lands. This means that on your first main phase, you can tap out to cast stuff, then head to combat, use this sword to untap all of your lands, and then on main phase two, you can cast a bunch of stuff again, or leave your mana up to use protection spells or removal spells. Essentially, this card doubles the amount of mana that you can use in a turn. Zendikar Resurgent is an enchantment that provides another way to double your mana, plus it draws you a card each time you cast a creature. The last of our Praetor friends is Vorinclex Voice of Hunger. Vorinclex is a 7-6 with Trample and two more abilities. The first gives you extra mana anytime you tap a land for mana. And his second ability says, whenever an opponent taps a land for mana, that land doesn't untap during its controller's next untap step. Of all the Praetors, I think that Vorinclex is probably by far the most hated in Commander, which makes him perfect for our deck. Zakama, Primal Calamity, has a ton of abilities, and he's absolutely nuts. He's exactly what this deck wants to cheat in for only 5 mana, but even if you have more than 5 lands to tap for mana, when you cast him, be sure to tap out completely, because when he enters the battlefield, you get to untap all lands that you control. So. Let's say you start your main phase with Joda and eight lands, tap all of them, cast a comma for five, then untap them, and proceed to cast two more huge spells at five mana apiece, or just do whatever else you wanna do with your remaining 11 mana, like activating his abilities a bunch of times. Every time you cast a spell with Ramos Dragon Engine on the field, it gets a plus one plus one counter for each, of that spell's colors. Then you can remove five plus one plus one counters from Ramos to add Wooberg to your mana pool not once, but twice. You can only activate that ability once per turn though, however, he'll still get the counters off of the cards that you cast using that mana. So you can basically just keep doing this over and over again every single turn. With Seedborn Muse, you can untap all of your stuff every single turn and start casting spells on your opponent's turns as well. She pairs especially well with Vidalcan Ori or Raf Capuchin that lets us cast our stuff at instant speed. Next up is Rashmi, Eternity's Crafter. With Rashmi out, whenever you cast your first spell each turn, you reveal the top card of your library. If it's a spell with lower CMC than the first spell that you cast, you can cast it for free. Otherwise, you draw it into your hand. Yidris, Maelstrom Wielder, is a 5-4 with Trample that also says whenever Yidris deals combat damage to a player, as you cast spells from your hand this turn, they gain Cascade. It's kind of worded weird, but basically, deal damage with Yidris to a player, 
and then the rest of your spells that turn get Cascade, and that is crazy powerful. Cascade is a nuts ability. Lastly, I'm running Chromatic, Ori, and Gigantha in the 99. Both of these permanents tap for 5 mana, which is just what we need for Joda. Gigantha's mana cannot be used on generic mana costs, which is no big deal with Joda's ability, and Chromatic Ori also fixes all of our mana, and you can pay 5, tap it, and draw a card for each color among permanents you control. Chromatic Ori is super good, and I cannot wait to try it out for the first time since I just added it. Moving on to win cons. Many of these crazy powerful creatures and spells are nearly win cons by themselves, but we've got a couple of cards to push this deck over the top out of nowhere. Triumph of the Hordes, Overwhelming Stampede, and Crater Hoof Behemoth essentially take our huge monsters to the next level by pumping them up, setting them loose, and letting them trample all over our opponent's creatures and crush everyone else sitting at the table. Expropriate is a well-known game ender that basically says you get an extra turn because you always, always, always vote time. And then you get to steal one permanent from each player unless they elect to give you another turn, which is awesome too. This card is nuts, don't ever underestimate it. On to the mana base. I am running a total of 37 lands in this deck, and I'm running all 10 of the allied and enemy fetch lands, all 10 shock lands, and then city of brass, command tower, exotic orchard, fabled passage, mana confluence, and reflecting pool, with two plains, two islands, two swamps, two mountains, and three forests. You do not have to have all of these cards to make this deck work, but it's definitely easier to run when you've got the fetch lands and the shock lands, and this isn't even the most optimal version of this mana base. So The last thing that I want to talk about are new cards from the last year that I haven't had the chance to test in my deck, and that I think would be a super good fit for it. I am super slow at updating my decks, so if you are like me and you already have a Jota deck, then hopefully this is helpful for you, but these are also just good cards that maybe you've recently opened and you want to build Jota, and now you can put them into your deck. So from Theros Beyond Death, we have Nyxbloom Ancient, which essentially triples your mana, and I haven't gotten one yet because I'm not really sure that this deck needs it, but I'm sure it could come in handy. The next cards are from Ikoria, and they are Ruinous Ultimatum and Emergent Ultimatum. Ruinous is an absolutely devastating one-sided board wipe that is arguably better than Cyclonic Rift in this deck, and Emergent Ultimatum basically says, search your library for three monocolored cards, your opponent chooses one, and you have to shuffle that one back into your deck, but then you get to cast the other two for free. So basically grab two Praetors and Expropriate, shuffle Expropriate back into your deck, and then cast two Praetors. That's pretty much how it works every time. Lastly, we've got a bunch of cards from Commander Legends that fit right into the deck. Emoti, Celebrant of Bounty, has Cascade and gives Cascade to all of your spells with six CMC or more. We've already talked about it, Cascade is such a powerful ability, and Emoti gives Cascade to the spells that you Cascade into as well, so you could cast Ulamog and potentially hit five more spells off the top of your deck. Continuing this trend of crazy Cascade cards, we have Apex Devastator, the ultimate Cascade spell that Cascades four times when you cast it. Kamal, Heart of Krosa, is mostly a pet card, but can give our huge creatures an overrun effect every single combat. I love Kamal. I completely underestimated Sphinx of the Second Sun until I saw it played in my buddy's Keenan deck. It was disgusting. This slots right into the section of cards in this deck that double the amount of mana that we can get in a single turn, and it's terrifyingly good. There is a cycle of monocolored 9 CMC mythic spells from Commander Legends, and I'm going to be slapping one of them right into this deck as soon as I get it, and testing another. Reshape the Earth searches your library for up to 10 land cards and puts them onto the battlefield. Imagine tapping 5 lands for Wooburg into Joda's ability to cast Reshape the Earth and then next turn having access to 15 lands. It is so beautiful and I want to play this card so bad. 
I want to try out Soul Fire Eruption as well, which says choose any number of target creatures, planeswalkers, and or players. For each of them, exile the top card of your library, then Soul Fire deals damage equal to that card's converted mana cost to that permanent or player. You may play the exiled cards until the end of your next turn. This is basically burn and or removal that also draws you cards that you can play for an entire turn cycle. Let me know what you think of these extra cards in the comment section below or comment what other cards you would like to run in your own Jota deck. Alright, you've made it to the end of this video. Please like this video and subscribe to our channel if you have not yet. Be sure to check out and sign up for our Patreon at patreon.com slash commandvalley to support us directly, view exclusive content, join our Discord, and receive merch and tons of other sweet perks. Thanks again to GameGrid Lehigh for sponsoring our channel. You can click on the link to their website in the description to shop for all of your magic needs there, and you'll be supporting our channel as well. GameGrid is now shipping nationwide, so take advantage of that. And be sure to join us on our live streams every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Mountain Standard Time for some Brawl on Arena. Lastly, you can find us on Twitter at CommandValleyP1 and on Facebook by clicking the link below. Thanks everybody, stay safe out there, and again, Happy New Year.